am pleased beyond really words to introduce Senator Rob Portman. He's co-chair of the International Conservation Caucus and has a long and storied history of conservation leadership. He is a past recipient of the ICCF's Teddy Roosevelt International Conservation Award, and he's going to make a few re brief remarks. Senator Portman. John, thanks very much. It's great to be back at the gala. And to Tanner, uh, you were there 10 years ago when this thing started as one of the founders. We appreciate your continued support and your uh, MC duties you do every, every year at this gala. Um, Connie, thank you too. Um, first of all, happy birthday, 10th birthday. It seems like it's been longer than that because we've had so many accomplishments at the ICCF. And one of the accomplishments is represented in this room tonight because as I look around, and as I heard earlier, I see uh, Democrat colleagues, I see Republicans, uh, I see independents, I see vegetarians, I see libertarians. Um, I see people from all around the world. It's amazing. This group brings people together, doesn't it? And that's not typical here in Washington. And that's one reason I believe in the ICCF, and I think it's a very effective body to be able to bring members of Congress together. I don't think there's another caucus that has as many members and as diverse a membership. I also think it works because conservation is such an important issue that brings people together. And that's understandable, really. When you think about it, what is conservation? It's really just very simple. It's about preserving a gift, and that is preserving our home, preserving the place where we all live, the earth that's been entrusted to us. It's an issue that affects the food we eat, the air we breathe, and the medicine that we take. So nothing could be more fundamental. I think that's one reason the caucus has received such strong bipartisan support, and why, once again, we've got such a successful gala here tonight. Uh, one reason I believe the ICCF is successful is that it follows uh, the tradition of Teddy Roosevelt. It's a model of conservation that says we're going to make the government a partner with the private sector by creating incentives to do what's right and using market forces to ensure that we help to preserve our natural resources. When Dave Barron first came to me to talk about this ICCF leadership role, uh, that's what he emphasized, and that's what I had indeed have seen over the years. By the way, I thought I was underdressed tonight until I saw Dave Barron's bush coat. <laughs> I've got uh, a lot of great Teddy Roosevelt uh, quotes, and one that I will give you tonight uh, I think is appropriate for the evening. Teddy Roosevelt said, it's not what we have that will make us a great nation, it's the way in which we use what we have. The conservation of natural resources is the fundamental problem. Unless we solve that problem, it will avail us little to solve all of the others. I've got a portrait of Teddy Roosevelt in my office. Some of you have seen it as you've come to visit me. He peers over me to try to ensure that um, I keep to the Teddy Roosevelt tradition. Uh, we remember him as being a great president who took us into the 20th century. But really, he was a naturalist. That's what he spent most of his career doing before politics. In fact, 14 of his 35 books were about nature. He loved to study it. He loved to write about it. As president, he not only was the father of our national parks, uh, but he also set aside 230 million acres of public lands, including 150 million acres of national forests. Conservation, obviously, central to his legacy. And I really view this group as having a role in continuing that legacy. We've heard of a lot of the accomplishments of the ICCF over the past 10 years under the leadership of Dave Barron and John Gant. I want to talk about a few others that were not mentioned. The ICCF has supported most recently the National Park Centennial Act, which has helped us to indeed continue the Teddy Roosevelt tradition by providing for the first time an historic match, the centennial match, where private sector funding can be matched by government funding both within the parks and within the Parks Foundation. The ICCF has supported the Tropical Forest Conservation Act, uh, legislation that I co-authored way back uh, 15 years ago, probably, and has now protected nearly 70 million acres of tropical forest all around the world, offsetting the carbon emissions, by the way, of about 18 million cars. The ICCF has supported the Save the Vanishing Species stamp, which Tom Udall and I worked on together. It has now raised over $2.5 million to protect endangered elephants, rhinos, tigers, great apes, marine turtles. This is working. 
The ICCF, of course, has supported the ban on ivory. And just since our last gala, think about this, just since our last gala, both the United States and China have instituted bans that are critical to saving this great African elephant. So the caucus has done some good work, but a lot more to go. And this work's not always easy. Uh, bipartisanship isn't always easy, particularly in this town, but that's okay. Another, te another Teddy Roosevelt quote, the best prize in life is to work hard at work that is worth doing. This work is certainly worth doing. One of the hardest workers in the field of conservation is someone who bears a famous name of Ted Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt's been mentioned numerous times tonight already. This Ted Roosevelt has become a champion for conservation in his own right. We've seen that in his leadership here, but we've seen that in his leadership all around the country. We've seen that in his leadership at the Wilderness Society, the Natural History Museum, as chairman of the Clean Tech Initiative at Barclays Capital. He's also lent his name and prestige and help tonight to tonight's gala as the chairman of our gala. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Ted Roosevelt IV. Rob, thank you for that extraordinarily over-the-top uh, introduction. If I had a brain in my head at all, I'd return to the table now and just black bask in the kindness of your words. By my count, I'm the seventh speaker up here. And that reminds me of what uh, Zaza Gaber's uh, uh, husband said on their wedding night. He said, I think I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm just not sure I know how to make it interesting. <laughs> what a great group this is. And we're gathered here for a wonderful reason, celebrating a mission that both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrat, embrace. International conservation and our historic commitment to leadership on this front. And that reminds me of a story that uh, Gaylord Nelson told me. And as you probably know, Gaylord was a very fine mimic. And he and his wife, every Saturday or every other Saturday, used to have a barbecue at their house. And they'd invite lots of different members from Congress to come over and have a barbecue, both sides of the aisle. Uh, and one day, uh, according to Gaylord, one of his friends from the Senate came up and said, Gaylord, that bill you got out just doesn't make a goddamn bit of sense. It's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. But it won't affect my state, and you're such a nice guy, I'm going to vote for it anyway. And we need to go back to that kind of uh, uh, relationship. <laughs> Our commitment to international conservation leadership stems from our national story. And that is a tale of many cities, actually a tale of many country places and people. Let me tell you about one of these. In order to save a subspecies of black bear, the Louisiana bear, I began to work with local and congressional leaders in the Mississippi Delta. And this is a part of the country that I dearly love. It has much changed, however, since T.R. hunted bar in the cane breaks there and heard the unmistakable double tap of the now extinct ivory-billed woodpecker. The Louisiana black bear also happens to be the subspecies that the old lion refused to shoot on his hunt, thus inspiring the creation of a famous toy, the teddy bear. The actual bear required saving in the 1990s, not because of greed and not because anyone was evil or malicious. It happened because of what we didn't know. What hurt this bear? The mistakes made by the USDA in the late 1970s when it urged farmers to put marginal farmlands into soybeans. The existing hardwood forests, the trees that filtered the water, and anchored the land in flood seasons were decimated. 
and the croplands that resulted were neither economically nor ecologically viable. With good intentions, we wrecked havoc. Then, for the sake of this bear, local conservationists and farmers did that miraculous thing. They decided to work together. Listed as threatened in 1992, the Louisiana black bear was remarkably delisted last year. It was an inspired bipartisan effort, and it was locally led, but benefited from the wisdom of an incentive-based federal program, the Wetlands Reserve Program. Now, my wife claims that I can't ever admit to being wrong. Are there any other men out there that hear this? So I will have to pretend here, since she is in the audience, that I actually didn't learn anything from this experience. I knew the truth all along. We are all still learning about resource management. As one famous American forester once from said, ecosystems are not only more complex than we think, they are more complex than we can think. Ecosystem knowledge, thankfully, is advancing and evolving. What our shared project requires is an ethical commitment to wildlife and people. As one of my Mississippi friends said, we've got to figure out how to let everyone wear the white hat. I happen to think that ICCF is exceptional at doing just that, bringing people together and letting them wear the white hat. Tonight's award winner certainly exemplify this approach one that embraces what a rangeland scientist and my personal friend, Rick Knight, calls the three dimensions of conservation, the human, economic, and ecological. But this is not easy. But as Senator Portman said, we have enormous good news to celebrate tonight and that China has pledged to eliminate its legal trade in ivory. We have both China's President Xi Jinping and President Barack Obama to thank for this accomplishment. This far-sighted action on China's part is a game changer, and the African elephant desperately needs a game changer. It is a not easy thing for China to do this. There are artisans and other workers who have made their living from carving ivory and small businesses built up around the legal trade. But China has made the commitment to move these artisans and other materials and shut the ivory trade down. It is a laudable step, and it must be matched elsewhere. But besides learning to wear and share the white hat of leadership, we should not forget to polish our sheriff's badges. Poaching and illegal fishing are reaching epidemic crisis levels. In Africa, this criminal activity is in danger of reversing the past 50 years of progress. And make no mistake here, this is organized crime at the same level and conducted just as ruthlessly as those who move drugs, guns, or human sex slaves across national borders. Criminals regard poaching as a low-risk, high-reward activity. We need to make certain that it is a high-risk crime and we need to do this soon and vigorously. Endangered species do not have the luxury of time. Local communities depend on these resources and also do not have the luxury of the time. The illegal wildlife trade and illegal fishing are robbing all of us. Currently, NOAA estimates that 30% of our fish consumption comes from illegal fishing. They estimate that it accounts for 24 billion worth of wild-caught marine fish. These pirate fleets destabilize local economies and undermine the conservation efforts of legal fishing operations that are trying to maintain a fragile resource. Our agencies need the personnel, funding, and legal framework to inspect, track, and prosecute both illegal fishing and wildlife poaching. 
We must be able to confiscate the assets and bank accounts of these criminals. Just as John Lacey, from Senator Portman's great state of Ohio, led the way in the late 19th century against rapacious market hunting that was decimating the plains, we need congressional champions today to crack down on the devastation of wildlife tracking. Who in today's Congress will be the next John Lacey? I hope he or she is here tonight. Charismatic species carry the soul of the conservation enterprise. We can find many justifications for saving them. When we address their survival, yes, we address water, soil, and land health. When we address their survival, yes, we also address economic health and political sta stability. But what truly inspires us to act? Beauty, grace, reverence, and piety. The elephant, the rhino, the whale, and the lion, all charismatic species, species remind us that life is bigger than ourselves. That double beat drumming of the ivory-billed woodpecker is gone now. It haunts the bayou, a memory of another time and another world. We will all be much diminished if we don't arise to this occasion. And an inauguration celebration is always a reminder of our potential to do just that, be more. Yeah.